Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in this world. The name of this ministry, Restoration Fellowship, our homepage, focusonthekingdom.org. You can find many links, many other websites. We have a monthly magazine called Focus on the Kingdom for free. Just click on magazine and next month is out already, uh, February. So today is the last Sunday of January 2023 already. Click on the month and the year, and you should be able to see this, a free PDF copy you can download, you can share, etc. And please do so. And we start next month with Why Not Trinity and Incarnation article that has been, um, has been uh, allowed for us to publish from Dr. Stephen Nemesh. If you'd like to know about Dr. Nemich, go to our Focus on the Kingdom channel, YouTube. I've done uh, two sessions with him, two interviews on different topics. And it's a very interesting article talking about why Dr. Nemich left the Trinity and the Incarnation, capital I. In other words, the belief that a second person of a trinity god took on or assumed flesh so hope you enjoy that actually i'll put that in the chat let's see we have many other websites the humanjesus.org we have christenemylove.com and jesuskingdomgospel.com we also have a podcast anthony reads his various publications Various books, last one there uploaded, Doctrine of the Trinity, I believe his first published book. And there are other recordings here, audio recordings of articles, and we're doing the magazines. We're trying to get most, the most we can out of that, reading the Focus on the Kingdom magazine. Okay, so we usually start this morning, if you're not uh, new to this stream, if you're watching live, welcome. If you're watching this as a recording, welcome as well. We usually start with the prayer, opening prayer known as the Shema. Anthony will pray, lead us in prayer here. <clears throat> and um, then we have a youth lesson this morning from Michelle and continued prayers for Michelle and her family. They suffered uh, the death of her husband, Tom, our brother. So we've had a couple of uh, very sad events in our small home church here in, by the way, we're in the south of Atlanta, Georgia. So prayers for Michelle and family. So Anthony will lead us in that. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction and the various points you make there and the visuals, which are to me extremely vivid and helpful. And so it's our custom to direct our audience's attention to the Shema, which is the Hear, O Israel, that every Jew recites twice, three times a day. Jews died for this, and Jesus was asked in Mark 12, which is a brilliant idea by Mark, by the way, to show that Jesus was a Jew who believed in the same God as the Jews. And so if you can convince yourself that the God of the Jews was Trinitarian, then go for it. But I don't recommend you try that. Everybody knows that the Jews were unitary monotheists. They believed that God was a single person and they expressed it in these Hebrew words, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And that top word on the left of the screen there, Echad, an Aleph, a Chet, and a Dalit, means one single. It's a mathematical term. Every child of two knows that one means one. This is not difficult, but alas, theology f fell into the hands of philosophically minded people who made everything fearfully complicated and then threatened you if you didn't believe it. That's not something that we can approve of. So that's the prayer, the confession that Jesus himself affirmed as being the most important first commandment. The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Very important. But the first, it gets lost all the time left out, is God is one single 
individual, the Shema. So keep that in mind at all times and recite it yourself daily to remind yourself of the words of Jesus, which are, of course, essential to salvation. With that in mind, then, I would ask you to bow your heads or to look up towards the heavens, whatever is your custom in prayer, and I will invite God to kindly send us his Holy Spirit, his operational presence and power, to be with us in this miracle of technology by which we are now addressing people all over the world. This is an extraordinary miracle, extraordinary blessing. We ask at this time that we spend this resurrection Sunday morning, it being the first day of the week, the beginning of new things, Resurrection Sunday, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this extraordinary technology you've allowed us to have, the talents of people who developed this, all that talent comes from you. We pray for every individual sharing with us this morning in the experience of reading the book of Acts together, that we can be attentive, that your spirit, your operational presence and power, and that of your son Jesus also, who's at your right hand, that that spirit may affect our minds positively, that we can be encouraged, as Paul said, by the words that we read, that we can pray for peace on earth in a very tortured and chaotic world as it is now. We do pray, may your kingdom come, may it begin full time, flat out, and all over the world, may it begin from Jerusalem and spread across the earth. We thank you now for this time together. We ask indeed for those who are suffering physically, that you would intervene to help them and extend their lives, give them more time to experience the precious thing that is life. Our prayer is offered as always in the name of the Messiah, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. Anthony will be back with we are in Acts chapter 423, by the way. Before then, a youth lesson from Michelle. When I was in middle school and all through high school, I had a very good friend who was a Catholic. She was afraid that she was going to go to hell and burn forever when she died. Mm -hmm. And this actually troubled her a lot. She was even depressed about this because she had family members that she knew were not living a Christian life and that they had died. And this made her very sad. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad for her because the church I went to didn't teach that. So I, I really you know, wanted to help her. And so I thought I would tell you a little bit maybe about some, some of the scriptures that you can have mm -hmm. to look for and just understand what happens when we die and what hope we have to look forward to, and maybe you can help your friends as well. First, I explained to her that when we die, we don't go to heaven or hell, but we, we're buried. We go to the ground, we're buried. You know, some people are uh, in an explosion and their bodies are obliterated or they drown and their bodies are eaten by fish or mm -hmm. sharks or something. So, you know, a lot of different things happen to our bodies, but God will put them back together. So I told her how we don't go to hell. We, we're buried in the ground as if we are asleep. And we call this the sleep of the dead. The sleep of the dead, first Psalm 13, 3, if, because I, that's the where it actually uses that phrase, at least in my version of the mm -hmm. Bible, the sleep of death. Okay, so that, it, I mean, David, you think he, he, he probably would have known what happened when he died. And there's also a verse later on that tells us that David is not, that he's embedded and in the grave, that he's not ascended to heaven. And so um, Acts 760 tells you what happens to Stephen. Stephen was stoned. You know, I don't know if you know about stoning, but they, that's a, that was a punishment back in the Bible days. That's one way of executing people. And they threw stones at them until they died. Sounds horrifying. But what happened to Stephen at the end of his stoning? He fell as asleep. So did Stephen just fall asleep after that stoning? Stephen was dead. Mm -hmm. And then one thing to, to know uh, that I would share with her is what happens when we're in the grave. There's several in Ecclesiastes, yeah. but this one is uh, tells you what's going to happen while we're in the grave. Mm -hmm. So if they were in hellfire burning, they would be aware of that. Mm -hmm. And there is no awareness. The Bible, the Bible tells us there's no awareness. So we, we know that there is 
a fire that is talked about in the Bible in the end times. I'm not going to go through all that right here today. There is a fire that will burn and the bad folks are going to be there, uh, Satan for one. And so um, that does not apply though to my granddad who died. So then I explained about what's going to happen after we die and once we're in the grave and uh, at that time I, I explained to her about how that Jesus is going to return to the earth and that he will set up a wonderful kingdom on the earth and the earth will be renewed it'll be like the garden of eden he'll set up a new government based on the laws and the love of god and Jesus is going to need a team that's a lot of work there's going to be a lot of people around still and so he's going to need a team to help with all these new duties and so those of us believers who have died will come back to life when Jesus returns and at what we call a resurrection, mm -hmm. and we will be changed into spiritual bodies, become <clears throat> immortal, which means we will not be able to die after that. Once we are raised, that'll be, we'll be able to walk through walls, and you know it'll be a really neat kind of a thing. I can't wait. Um, but there will also be people on earth at that time who haven't died. So just so we would understand that, I, I wanted to read this about how we will all rise together and meet Jesus in the sky. There are, as he's returning, there are several verses, one of them, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, but also 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. I think this is like a, a new living or living Bible sort of a translation. It says, and now, dear brothers, I want you to know what happens to a Christian when he dies, so that when it happens, you will not be full of sorrow as those who have no hope. And I thought of my friend when I read this, that she, she just felt so sad about all this. I can tell you this directly from the Lord, that we who are still living when the Lord returns will not rise to meet him ahead of those who are in the grave. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a mighty shout and a mighty shout of an archangel. He's going to be coming, you know, Jesus returning with angels and the heavenly hosts, you know, all kinds of uh, angelic beings are coming with him. It's going to be a big entourage but he wants us to come and meet him. The great trumpet call of God and the believers who are dead will be the first to rise to meet the Lord. Then we or whoever, Paul thought he was gonna still be alive at this time, but whoever is alive and is a believer at that time, whoever are alive and remain on earth will be caught up with them, the dead people who are rising, and to meet the Lord in the air and remain with him forever. So comfort and encourage each other with this news. So to me, this was very encouraging to know this as a child and to be able to explain it to my friends who didn't understand it, particularly my, my one friend. Some of my friends didn't care at all, but my one friend was very troubled about it all. And so are we going to meet the Lord in the air and just hang out in the air? Or are we going <laughs> to then turn around, Jesus is going to turn around and go back up to heaven? No, we're not going to heaven. It's coming to earth. So there will be this kingdom on earth that we talked about. We will live and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. That's called the millennium. And we'll have jobs. The Bible calls it that we'll be kings and priests. That's kind of like, you know, what's that really mean? So it means leaders, it means governors, administrators, it means teachers. We'll teach the laws of God and Jesus to these people. A lot of people have never even heard of how to live together in peace with somebody. These will be the mortal people who are still alive on earth at the time. We will be team Jesus. We're going to be his helpers. And it'll be a peaceful, renewed earth, like I said earlier, like the Garden of Eden. Once we are changed, we won't be able to die. And it means we'll be able to fly. We'll be able to, you know, fly through the universe, really, like the angels. Or we can appear as humans on the earth and uh, interact with the people on the earth. You know, when Jesus was resurrected, he came and ate supper with the apostles <laughs> and then he walked through the wall. So it'll be a great time and it'll be no war and fighting. Satan is going to be bound up into a special prison God's got for him. And he won't be able to influence people to do bad things. So even the animals are going to have a good nature. People are going to be happy, be at peace inside. It says in Isaiah eleven six, and another one in Isaiah 65, 25. It says that um, kids can even have a lion as a pet. Now, can you imagine that now? If you had a lion right now, it might bite your head off. Or your... But you'll be able to have a pet lion, kids. I think that sounds awesome. So when it, you understand that when it says like the the calf and, and the lion or the wolf, the, there are enemies right now. Right now, lions and, and wolves and leopards, they eat little baby animals, little baby 
cows and things, but then they're going to get along and they're all going to be together and they'll be your pets. The little kids will have them as pets. Can't wait. I'm particularly excited to know that I won't ever have to pull weeds again because there's not going to be any weeds there. If it's the Garden of Eden, there is not going to be weeds. As a young person, I under understood that this whole kingdom idea was why God put me on this earth. I wasn't depressed about what would happen when I died. Um, it was comforting and it was exciting to know what God had in store for those of us who accept Jesus as our Savior and believe and obey him. He wants us to go through all kinds of experiences while we're on this earth that will teach us and make us into the kind of people that he needs to be his teachers. That's why we should always use our talents and try to be the best that we can be. God gave us these talents and gifts so that we can be useful to him in his kingdom. He needs people that can sing. He mm -hmm. needs people that are, you know, can do all kinds of things, administrative things. And so we're supposed to be now using those talents and developing them and trying to be as good as we can so that we will be useful to him. I didn't need to worry I would go to hell if something wrong, like if I did something wrong, like my Catholic friend did. I knew that yes, I sinned, but if I repented and had the proper attitude of trying to do better, God would forgive me and I could use that experience to gain a bit more knowledge of how to be more useful to him. So I hope that all of you can have hope and comfort in understanding this and possibly be able to share it with your friends. I especially hope that each of you takes on the challenge that God has given to you, to all of us, to, so that we can be the best we can be on earth and be great leaders in his kingdom. Great message there. Thank you, Michelle, that youth lesson. Okay, uh, so before we go to the book of Acts, again, we're in Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Anthony will lead us through that reading once again. Before then, I'd like to play the opening to my last debate. I debated uh, first time a self-professed binitarian. The debate was centered on whether or not Jesus is the so-called principal agent of the Genesis creation. So just want to play here my opening and I'll put the link to the full debate in the chat. I will present the following three points. One, God alone is the creator. Two, the word of God is not Jesus and three, Creation was for Jesus, not by Jesus. From Moses to the rest of the Old Testament prophets, to Jesus and his apostles in the New Testament, God alone, without any, quote, principal agent, that is, anyone else, created everything. Job chapter 9, verse 8, he alone made the skies. Isaiah 44, verse 24, I am Yahweh doing all things, stretching out the heavens by myself, spreading out the earth, and some Hebrew manuscripts even add, who was with me? In the New Testament, at least four times Jesus says someone else alone created. Matthew 19, verse 4, having you read, he says, referring to Genesis 1, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. Note what Jesus said here, he, not we. In Acts chapter 17, we find Paul explaining to the Greeks 
that the unknown God is in fact the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. These are but a sampling of the over 100 explicit statements throughout both testaments that witness to the lone creator God, who is always the Father, with no principal so-called agent. Many Trinitarian commentaries seem to understand this simple fact. The pulpit commentary on Isaiah 44, verse 24, God did not delegate the creation of the heaven and the earth to an inferior spirit. He did not even call in the cooperation of a helper. Singly and solely by his own power, he created all things. The Moody Bible commentary on the same verse, God's acts of creation were comprehensive, meaning that no other God created anything. God created alone. He needed no help in stretching out the heavens or spreading out the earth. He brought it about by his power alone. No God stood before God, against God, or with God in the formation of the world. If you check any standard lexicon, logos, the Greek for word, never means a separate distinct person apart from God. The Hebrew and Chaldee lexicon to the Old Testament defines the Hebrew term davar as a single word in the proper sense in the Greek translation logos, rema, 2 Kings 18.36, Job 2.13. Also, it means decree, plan, proposal, 2 Samuel 17, 6, 1 Kings 1, verse 7. Little Scott, a Greek-English lexicon, defines logos as word, speech, statement, discourse, refutation, account, explanation, and reason. As we can see, the word logos is never defined as a person. So there's no justification for capitalizing word or using personal pronouns like he or him in John 1.1 verse 3. This is why in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord, that is the word of God, is never referred to as a he or him in either Hebrew or the Greek translation known as the Septuagint or the LXX. We should not confuse grammatical gender with biological or sexual gender. In other words, just because the Greek logos is a masculine noun, this does not mean God's word is an actual person a human male, no less. This is something all English translators from the Greek manuscripts before the King James in 1611 understood quite well by referring to the word in John 1.1 1, 1, as it and not him. Again, the point is the word or the word of God never once means a person in the Old Testament or in the Gospel of John. In the New Testament, Logos is primarily code language for the gospel message. Ephesians 1, verse 13, Paul says, You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And in John 1, 1, the word refers to God himself. Note the following translations and paraphrases that read, The word was God himself. Or, The divine word and wisdom was there with God, and it was what God was. In his gospel, John goes on to use the word as either a revelation from God or again the message about the kingdom of God to Israel now entrusted to Jesus and his followers. In John 10, 35, God calls people gods to whom the word of God came. And in John 17, verse 8, he says, I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. As a result, Jesus never says, I am the word, but he does say, I am the bread, I am the vine, I am the way, etc. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew preposition with, et, translated as pros in Greek, is used to describe what is in God's heart or mind. In Job 10, God's life, love, wisdom, power, and even his care are said to be with him. In Isaiah 40 and 62, his reward is with him. And in 2 Kings chapter 3, some translate the Hebrew as the word of the Lord is with him. Similarly, a section of the Dead Sea Scrolls document from BC times echoes John 1.1. 1, 1. By his knowledge, everything has been brought into being and everything that is, he established by his purpose 
and apart from him, nothing is done. The Hebrew agrees with the rest of the New Testament Greek use of the phrase proston theon, with God, which is never used for a person with God. Hebrews 2.17, things are with God. Acts 24.16, conscience, with God. Romans 5.1, peace, with God. 2 Corinthians 3.4, 1 John 3.21, confidence, with God. And 1 Thessalonians 1, 8, faith is said to be with God. Also note that John always uses the preposition para or meta, translated with, and never pros, to express the proximity of one person to another. Similarly, in the rest of the New Testament, the gospel is said to be with, that is pros, you. Galatians 2, 5, meaning in your thinking, in your mind. Therefore, John 1, 1 cannot mean the Son was with the Father. And John's own commentary shows that this word was not Jesus. For example, the word in John 1, 1 equals the word of life in 1 John chapter 1, which is the promise of life in the age to come. That is what, not who, was with the one God who is the Father always. And both Trinitarians and Binitarians acknowledge that the Word was with the Father. This explains John's use in his first letter of four neuter relative pronouns, that which or what was from the beginning, in reference to the Logos, the Word of God, the Word of Life. Also note the parallels with the Word of God in John 1.1 and the words of eternal life later in the gospel in John 6, verse 68, and the word of life here in 1 John 1, verses 1 and 2. In his gospel and letters, John uses words like news and message or eternal life to mean the eternal gospel, as he calls it later in Revelation 14, verse 6. In other words, the word in John 1, 1, that is the word of life, equals the gospel report, proclamation about the coming kingdom of God on earth. This, of course, is not a person. So again, there is no justification for putting a capital W on word and using personal pronouns to refer to it and not him. The last point, it would be downright negligent to conclude that the New Testament writers are somehow contradicting the Old Testament tenet that God is the lone creator. So whenever the New Testament says God the Father created all things in or through his Son, it should be understood through the biblical worldview. For example, Paul says in Colossians 1.16, for in him, that is Jesus, all things in heaven and on earth were created, that is, by God. And again in verse 17, Paul says all things have been created again, by God, through him, and for him. Note, Paul does not say all things were created by Jesus, which would mean he was a principal agent of creation, but Paul uses the Greek preposition en, translated in, that is, in Jesus. According to noted Trinitarian scholars like Dr. James Dunn and Nigel Turner, the Greek preposition here is causal, that is, because of Jesus, or with Jesus in intention. The point is simply that Jesus was the purpose for the whole of creation. Hay, in his Abingdon New Testament commentary on Colossians, says that Jewish tradition had previously said that God created the universe through his wisdom, Proverbs 8, Wisdom 7, or his word, see Philo. God created the world for the Son, indicative of a divine eschatological purpose. And Rabbi Yochanan in the third century AD said the world was created for the sake of the Messiah. So it would be strange for God to have said, I have created all things for myself. Remember, 100 plus explicit statements showing God, who is the Father, always as the lone creator, the Word of God is never Jesus in the Old Testament. For example, God never talks to a word. God never procreated a word. 
and the word is not your mediator, let alone your redeemer. And all things were created by God the Father for his Son. All right, I hope you enjoy that. The opening to my last debate with a self-professed binitarian, and I put the link in the chat. So we are in Acts chapter 4. If you'd like to follow along with Anthony's own translation slash commentary, onegodtranslation.com. I click on Acts. You can also listen to Anthony read the translation at the top here. And we are in verse 23, and this is after some of the apostles are jailed. And it's all yours, Anthony. Okay, Carlos, thank you very much. And my translation, of course, is not some sort of infallible drop from heaven translation, heaven forbid. It's my attempt to translate the Greek as accurately as I can. But most of the translations available to you, I don't recommend the King James because it's an old fashioned form of English, creates a kind of fog barrier between you and the text. Don't recommend that and it's simply wrong in some verses like 1 John 5, 7, which sounds like a Trinitarian statement and it is omitted from all modern translations. So I recommend you don't use the King James version, but the Revised Standard Version the revised version of 1881 is very, very good. And the new revised standard version, very good. And some of the paraphrases are just brilliant. Sometimes they depart from the sense of the Bible. They will say that Jesus went back to heaven. That's a complete falsehood in some of those modern paraphrases. No text says that Jesus went back to heaven when he hadn't been there before. So watch out for those things, but do not accept that my translation is in, in some sense without error because none of us translates with perfect accuracy. We do our best, but by all means, avoiding the King James, I recommend you also use the new American Standard Version, which is a very accurate and, and somewhat literal translation. Use it by all means with care, but do not believe in anybody's infallibility in translation. So we're in the book of Acts, and I will give you one phrase to summarize what Paul was, what uh, Carlos was saying just now. Listen to this and try to get this in mind. Jesus is what the word, with lowercase w, Jesus is what the word became, not one-to-one -one equal with that pre-existing word. You see that? Jesus is now, of course, he's the word of God since he was born. Jesus is what the word became in John 1, 14, not one-to-one -one equal with a pre-existing word. That's a brilliant summary by a theologian whose name I, I really need not mention, but I will mention it. Gopelt, a German, says that so well. You need for yourself and for your children some slogan statements that you repeat, which summarize somewhat complicated things in a very easy, memorable way. So Jesus in John 1.14 is what the word became. So after he came into existence at his birth, then he is the walking word. He's God's thinking, God's speaking, walking in a human being. That is just brilliant in the same way Paul talks about Jesus being wisdom, walking wisdom. So wisdom and word there are personifications. They're like people, but they're not people. God's attributes, God's intelligence, God's saying. So when you read John 1, 1, you're reading about in the beginning, in the Genesis account, God was speaking. That's why you read there in Genesis, God said, God said, God said. That verb said becomes the word word with a lowercase w. So the plain fact is, as Carlos was saying, the word word in the Hebrew Bible never, ever, ever, ever means a person. So how could readers possibly be expected to think that when John introduces the word in John 1, 1, how could that suddenly be a person? You've been fooled if you've been told that's a person there. It's not a person until it becomes a person in John 1, 14. It's like the water became wine. Guess what? That wine 
was water before it became something else. So by all means, because this is perhaps the most important theological point there is for you and your children, Jesus is what the word, lowercase w, what the word became, not one-to-one -one equal with a pre-existing invented capital W-O-R-D. Okay, so I'm so glad we had a chance to cover that. Please pay close attention and by all means ask any questions when we do our Q&A or just write to us and we will give you further information on this most important definition of who God and who Jesus are. Now we're in Acts. In preparing for these lessons, I'm utterly bowled over in a sense by how accurate and how careful Luke is. Do you realize that Luke, our brother Luke, wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else? That's an enormous privilege. And you know, of course, that Luke was probably the only non-Jew of the authors of the New Testament. He wasn't by birth a Jew, but he was a Gentile and God has privileged him to a vast degree, a huge privilege to confer upon the whole world forever the New Testament accounts of Christianity. And so Luke wrote the whole gospel of Luke, addressing it to some nobleman called Theophilus. And then he followed that by writing the whole 28 chapters of the book of Acts. And the full title of the book that we're reading today is the Acts of Apostles, capital A, Apostles. I'm going to make a very strong point as we go through that you are not, you and I are not re living in apostolic days. As we get to these various points, I'll be repeating that, that when you walk by somebody and your shadow falls upon them, they don't automatically get healed. That's astonishing. When somebody lies to you, as we're going to see that uh, Ananias and Sapphira did, they don't drop dead in front of you. So I want you to understand that God is acting in these apostolic times uniquely. And there are verses in the Old Testament, Isaiah, which say, oh God, why have you kept silent so long? God himself says, I've been silent. And I think he's been relatively silent. Not that he cannot do miracles as he wishes and certainly does. He works in our lives, that's, quite, that's entirely right but you're not going to be experiencing quite the same degree of spectacular miracle and sign and wonder. You're not going to experience that today quite to the degree that you're finding it in this extraordinarily interesting account of the early church. So we're in Acts 4 verse 23 and you see that it says when they'd been released, they came to the other believers and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. The Bible is a book heavily relying on the sense of authority. It loves the idea that somebody's in charge, either good or bad, and the people follow them or don't follow them. A huge sense of who's in charge, just as you see on the news day after day after day after day currently, the question is who's going to fix this mess? That's what everybody's discussing. That principle of government, authority, of a, a wonderful government as distinct from confusion, the whole qu question of truth versus lies. These are the issues being reported. I'll use the word reported directly to make you think of the news that you watch, reported by our brother Luke, who wrote a massive section of the New Covenant scriptures, what we call the New Testament. So, when Peter and John had been released, what? Released? Yes. If you are a true believer, Jesus says, Paul says, you're going to be hated. Hated. Because Satan is behind the thinking of the unbeliever. Satan is the one who is the god of this present evil system. Universal god, Satan is. Satan is a liar. And Satan does not want the truth to be known. In that context, I, I leave you for your notes in the margin, Luke 8 to 12, which is astonishing. Jesus there gave us a brilliant intelligence report in Luke 8, 12. 
Jesus there, I, I'll just refer to it because it seems to me it fits in well with this idea of imprisonment and release and so on. In Luke 8, 12, we read that when anybody hears the message of the kingdom, and I want to speak more about the gospel message and how to define it correctly, because it's not being defined for you well in the theological circles today. So our whole point, I mean, our whole point is that you must define the gospel with accuracy. So when they'd been released, freed, they came to the other believers. So these people are believers. So what's a believer? What's a believer? Oh, you've got to believe in Jesus, they say. Well, what does that mean? The, the devil is a master of foggy, vague, uninterpreted, uh, unexplained words. Won't you just accept Jesus? What, what does that mean? Wait, 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 wait. How, what does it mean to accept Jesus? It means to accept the words of Jesus. So if there's one thing you'd learn from our efforts here in ACT, it is that you must insist on the message of Jesus. That's to say the message actually preached by Jesus and not vaguely accepting him in your heart, which is so vague, so unclear, that it's responsible for all the confusion we see in denominationalism today. So they came to the other believers, that's to say believers in the gospel of the kingdom in the name of Jesus, Acts 8, 12. Easily remembered because Acts 8, 12 should go along with Luke 8, 12. Got it? Twice over, 8, 12. Acts 8, 12, marvelous summary of the Christian faith. And Luke 8, 12, the devil in Luke 8, 12 knows how dangerous the gospel of the kingdom is. And so the devil, according to Luke 8, 12, works hard to prevent you and your friends from accepting the gospel of the kingdom. So I recommend when you say gospel for the rest of your life, you always say gospel of the kingdom. In that way, you'll be doing your little part. We're all doing our part to restore clarity to what the gospel is. So these other believers, believers in the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, Acts 8, 12, they reported. I like this language of reporting news. It fits in so well with our own personal experience, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this. You're watching reports of all sorts of things on the news. This is the current news of the day. The most devastatingly and interestingly fascinating news and reports you could possibly imagine. So what happened then? All the chief priests, note the sense of authority here. The Bible is very conscious, conscious of who is chief, who's in, in charge. Who's the authority? The chief priests and the elders, the seniors, those with the ex express uh, experience of knowing what the faith was, had said to them, okay, they came to the other and reported all of the chief priests, those are the enemy here. I stress now, the enemies in this story are the religious leaders. You'll note that Jesus often condemned the religious leaders more so than he did the atheists and the agnostics. The great danger to all of you listening is from religion. That's why Jesus said that so many multitudes of people will say in that future day, look, we preach as Christians. We did miracles as Christians. We did all these wonderful things, Jesus. And Jesus will respond by saying, get out of here. I never recognized you. I don't like that verse. I don't take any pleasure in it, but it's certainly important that we do warn our audiences against the dangers of false religion. So they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when these fellow Christians heard it, here's what they did. With one mind, they raised their voices to God. Please note the enthusiasm, the zeal, the excitement. I'm impressed as I watch the news about the excitement for football, by the way. Have you seen the passion with which people invest themselves in one team or another? Well, that sort of passion should be expressed in you in regard to the gospel of the kingdom and the name of Jesus. So look how excited they were. They raised their voices. They shouted because they were so driven and so de uh, desperately excited about the faith, they said to God, here are the words, Lord of all, you are the one. Oh, not you are the three. 
they were strictly Unitarian believers, of course, because Jesus had been and they were following Jesus. You are the one who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that's contained in the heaven and the earth and the sea. I love that. Do you concentrate on the creation enough? I walked outside today and here in our garden here in Georgia, the daffodils are blossoming. That is an absolute miracle. How did they know when it was time to open those yellow petals or it might be white or different colors of daffodils? I didn't even know that till being married to a master gardener, I'm learning this. But do you in fact celebrate God as you look at the creation? When we walk out of our door in the morning, there's a bird that recognizes us and it begins to tweet. It sounds as though it's saying, we miss you. We miss you. Now, it's not literally saying that, but the animal creation around us, the birds and the bees and the daffodils and the flowers are a reflection of the existence of God. So I recommend then you praise God for the miracle of creation that you encounter as you walk out into your yard, your garden. You are the one, you are the sole creator. This is straight Unitarianism. You, God, are the one remembering that God means the Father 1,300 times in the New Testament, 1,300 times. You think that you'd get the idea that that is supposed to be impressive. God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And you, God, addressing God, you can talk to God here as they did in prayer. You said by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is very personal but not a third person. I hope you get that phrase right. Very personal, It's not some sort of impersonal power like plugging into an electric circuit. No, no, no. It is the spirit of God or of Jesus indistinguishably. By the way, the, the effect of the Holy Spirit, which is God's or Jesus' presence and power in your life, you said, inspired by Holy Spirit, through our father, your servant David, Please note the constant stress on the importance of Abraham and David. If you're teaching your children, teaching yourself the Bible story, which is essential, you must know that Abraham is the father of the faithful. You must know that the gospel was preached ahead of time to Abraham. That's what Paul said, um, what is said there in, in, in the New Testament. You must know that the gospel of the kingdom was preached ahead of time to Abraham. So go back and look at the story. He is the father of the faithful. And of course, David is the other great key in the biblical story. So you start with Abraham, let's say 2000 BC roughly, go ahead a thousand years to David. Everybody loves a story. You must instruct yourself and your children in the stories. It begins with Adam actually who failed. And Jesus comes along as the second Adam. And you do remember that in Genesis 3, we're told there that there's going to be somebody called the seed, which means descendant. I repeat, the word seed means descendant. Somebody who comes after them as a descendant. The seed of Eve, Eve's descendant is going to be the Messiah. You see, that's the story which links you then like a chain link back step by step in the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, step by step back to Adam and Eve, then on to Abraham, then on to David, and then on to Jesus. You must have that outline structure of the story clear, otherwise you don't know the gospel. And though David now is being quoted from Psalm Two. We have 150 Psalms, many of whom were written by David. I remind you that David was a God, was a person, I should say. David was a person, a human being who reflects the mind of God uniquely. He was beloved by God. Now, God doesn't exactly have favorites. I see that. But you don't know, probably, the Bible says that God hates people who sin. I thought it, God loved everybody. No, 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 no. Ultimately, of course, God wants everybody to repent, but God is a judge between good and evil all the time. Your servant, David, think of that. David was a servant of God. That's a huge privilege. So 
work hard to understand what David thought, how he prayed and so on. And David said, why did the nations rage? My goodness, there seems to be a battle going on here. David is asking that question in Psalm 2, which is really the first Psalm. The first Psalm, number one, is introductory, I remind you. Psalm 2 is the beginning of the whole book of Psalms, and it starts with a battle. It means here in Psalm 2 that the nations are in a fury, and the people, the unconverted people, that is, are plotting a futile opposition. Can you imagine that? Talk about a drama, talk about a movie. The Bible is the most thrilling, gripping story of the battle between good and evil. And verse 26, the kings of the earth, again, another authoritative word, the kings, the rulers, be they government rulers as royalty, as uh, we now have in England, or any form of government you like to mention. All of those leaders of the world systems, look what they're doing. They're taking a stand, and these rulers are gathered together, what, against the Lord and against his anointed one, his Messiah. The whole Bible is about God, who is one person, and God's anointed Messiah. One God and one Messiah. Your holy servant, Jesus. Jesus. You remember David was called the servant of God, and immediately Jesus is called holy servant of God. That must prove to anybody who's open-minded that Jesus couldn't be God, because Jesus is said to be the holy servant of God, whom you anointed. Nobody anoints God. That's just not reasonable. Anointing means you have holy oil poured on your head, and that sets you apart as a servant of the one God. And in verse 28, these wicked people did whatever your authority and your plan predetermined to happen. Now, that's not Calvinistic predestination. Those people chose to do what they're doing, but it was allowed by God within God's plan. God said, all right, you have free will. If you want to oppose me, you want to stand against me, go for it. I'll show you that that's going to be a very bad idea. But it wasn't preordained. Can you imagine the idea that God caused people to be evil beyond any choice they had and then punished them for doing it? That is unspeakably bad. So do not be misled into thinking that God's authority and plan excluded their free will. They determined to do it and God is going to punish anybody who opposes him. Verse 29, now, Lord, addressing the Lord God, please note their threats. You ask God, you invite God here to watch and see what's happening, a very natural way to speak, and give to your servants, all of the Christians are to be God's servants, were in a situation of obedience and were working for God, give us then, your servants, the ability to speak your gospel word. I took the license, the liberty of writing gospel word. The Greek simply has word there, but the public doesn't know that the word of God is not, I repeat, not just a synonym for the Bible. As I said to you earlier, theology, what you learn in church, tends to be a masterful obscuring, veiling the truth. So people hear word, well, I got the word, I got the Bible. No, 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 no. When we have word, it means the gospel word nearly every time. You see, the apostles who wrote, and those, uh, Luke who's not an apostle, he's an exception, but the prophets and apostles wrote the Bible, they knew how clever the devil was. And so they tried to arm you in their Bible writing against any possible confusion. So what have we done? We've gotten confused. So your job as a teacher then, as you contribute to the teaching of the kingdom of gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, is to help people understand what these words mean. If you think that I'm mad about my flat means that I'm angry about my flat tie, you've misunderstood me. I didn't say that. I said, I'm very excited about my apartment because I'm a British English speaker 
And even as between American English and British English, there's room for all sorts of confusion and misunderstanding. And the Bible is particularly like that. People say, well, I just read my Bible. Yes, you do, but you don't know that sometimes the English of your Bible is not the English that you speak at home. So you need some learning in order to, to understand scripture properly. And I think I've helped you there by pointing out that when they're praying here, they're saying to God, give us the ability to speak your gospel of the kingdom word, because that's what they do. They weren't just asking people to receive Jesus in their hearts vaguely, much too vague. Don't use that language, use the biblical language and word means the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, you're supposed to speak it, and this is a lesson for all of us, with boldness as and when the opportunity arises, you can say to people, why do you want to go to heaven? Because Jesus won't be there. Just that. They go away thinking about that. You say to a Jehovah's Witness, how could Jesus be an angel when a holy angel cannot die? You need to have some very concentrated, pithy statements to leave with your friends as they come to see you. And what happens then, and this has been our experience, people go away and they think, my goodness, that's interesting. Let me check that out. Then you ask them to be a Berean and they begin to understand the Bible. And then they'll write to you and say, my goodness, now I get it. God is one person. Whoa. The gospel is the gospel about the future kingdom, which is your inheritance. And I'll say more about that as we go through these words, your inheritance and your reward. Oh, no, Paul, look at me. I don't deserve any reward. Wait a minute. God is a father who is delighted and looking forward to rewarding his servants, giving them a prize. So I want to say more about that as we go through these words. But the idea that the gospel simply means that Jesus came to do three days work to die, to be buried and to be raised. The idea that that's the totality of the gospel is a ghastly, may I say, falsehood. It's only half a gospel. I don't think half a gospel is going to do you any good. So the kingdom gospel is essential. And you won't need to go on saying that over and over and again. Now, then they're praying here, these early apostolic Christians. They're praying to God that he would stretch out his hand. The Bible uses the word hand as the symbol of activity. Go to work, God, please, they're saying, and heal and cause signs and wonders to happen through the name. All right, what is name? Not how to pronounce the name in Hebrew. People think that might be right. No, no, no. The name is everything you are and everything you stand for. Not just how to pronounce your name in Greek or Hebrew or any other language. No, no, not just a label. Although it is that in your English, in your American or British English, not your name just as a label of who you are. Your name means everything you are, everything you stand, you stand for, the whole of your agenda. So hallowed be your name is nothing to do with pronouncing the name correctly in Hebrew. Heaven forbid, that's the most wooden, may I say, ignorant misunderstanding of the word name, which means the whole of who you are, what you stand for, and your whole of your agenda. So what they're saying here, God, please let these miracles occur in the name of, by the authority of your holy servant, Jesus, which surely would prove he couldn't be God. God is not the holy servant of another God. That's just not conceivable. Your holy servant, Jesus, and David was also the servant of God. Now look what happened in 31. When they prayed that prayer, the place where they were gathered was shaken. What? I stress, you are probably not experiencing that sort of thing when you pray in the morning. How often has the house in which you're praying actually shaken? My point here is that apostolic Christianity, and we're reading the Acts of the Apostles, is a dramatic, exciting opening of the business type of affair. When you open a new business, you might put the balloons out every morning. Of course we do. But you don't put them out every morning forever after that. 
So this is a demonstrable special apostolic time. You, I say you, the audience listening today, cannot be an apostle. You haven't seen Jesus alive after the resurrection, nor have you done these dramatic miracles. That's very important. Doesn't mean the Bible isn't for you. This Bible, every word of it is scripture and God is speaking to us, but he's here demonstrating what he did through apostles. And you will not measure up to that because you cannot be an apostle. Doesn't mean that God cannot act and intervene in your life. Of course, we know that. But that's a, an important distinction to keep in mind, I suggest. Okay, um, back to the text. What do you got there, Carlos? Yeah, just a few comments, Anthony, on verse 27. We oftentimes use the New English Translation Study Bible online. You can find this for free. And um, it has copious amounts of footnotes marked by the numbers there. So if you click on the number, that's a footnote. Just a few on verse 27. For indeed, both Herod and Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together in this city against your holy servant. And uh, just a comment on the word against number 66 the application of psalm 2 verses 1 to 2 is that jews and gentiles are opposing jesus the surprise of this application is that jews are now found among the enemies of god's plan uh, i'll say it again this is important jews are now found anthony mm among the enemies of God's plan. Somewhere Paul says that the Jews are the enemies of the cross, I think. In yes. The... Yes. So what do we make about that with the whole Zionist movement? And Well, it's quite absolute, very, very important. The Jewish people who have not accepted Jesus, in fact, they arrested Jesus. This is a low point for Jews. When God promised to send them their Messiah, and eventually he did send them their Messiah, who began to exist in the womb of his mother, which all human beings must to qualify to be human, what did they do? They killed him. One day, all of the Jewish people are going to weep and beg God for forgiveness. So they are enemies of God's project, his kingdom gospel plan when they should have been the chief exponents of it, and indeed, many of the early leaders, of course, were Jewish. All of the writers of the New Testament were Jewish, with the exception probably of Luke. But the Jews were God's chosen people. But what we now then have to say is that the whole of the international true church, Brazilians, Nicaraguans, uh, people from Colombia and so on, from England, from America, they are now the Israel of God. So please note that the word Israel has two distinct meanings in the New Testament. It can mean the natural born physical Jew, but it also means more importantly, the international church of God. And your verse there in your notes would be Galatians 6.16. 6, so if you are a true believer, a believer in the gospel of the kingdom and in the name of Jesus, then you count as Israel you are now God's special servant and choice. That's a very important distinction. Okay. And well, another okay. comment here yeah. on uh, verse, so we just stopped at verse 31. Yes. You will note there the Net Bible has, uh, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak yes. the word of God. Yes. Uh, and it's got a footnote 80, or yes. speak God's message. Exactly right. In your translation yes slash paraphrase yes you have the gospel word yes of god yes uh we had a comment here from nancy i thought the word was the gospel message of the kingdom of god yeah, right exactly right if you want to yeah. talk about that more well that's exactly right the word word is not vaguely the bible when they say we're preaching the word, we don't mean we're vaguely preaching the Bible. That's too unclear. The gospel word, 
Nancy, is exactly what you're suggesting. The word is the gospel message of the kingdom of God. Right. Yes, absolutely right. It's not vaguely the Bible. I have another translation close to me here called the translator's translation. It's a translation by missionary linguists. And they have a very nice footnote exactly along the lines, Carlos, that you're pointing out here. That is that the word is not just a synonym for the Bible. Don't talk about accepting Jesus or ask him in your heart. You're inviting confusion. You always talk about accepting the gospel of the kingdom and the name of Jesus. Acts 8, 12, along with Luke 8, 12. Very easy to remember. And then you'll be speaking sense in the biblical sense. Otherwise, the devil will use your words to confuse and confound. So accuracy is exactly right. And Nancy's then backing us up there. Wonderful. Just a question here, Anthony, yeah. sort of a rhetorical, but yeah. how come some churches who do the so-called <laughs> tongues yeah. every Sunday, yeah. but they don't expect their building to shake? Well, they, why not? If they think they're apostolic and if they're speaking foreign languages unlearned, which is what happened in the book of Acts, if they are really doing that, but they're, most of them never bothered to, to find out if they are, so take your tape recorder and go around and record the so-called tongues. Now, if they are genuine, recognized foreign languages, that's a miracle. But I'm afraid to tell you that that has not been the case. And linguists and language people have taken their recorders all around the world. And what they've found, as have many who have come to the knowledge of the truth, I likewise have simply said, look, I was preaching and teaching gibberish. When I did my tongues, I now understand that I was just babbling gibberish. I don't recommend that God is in any way pleased with your just making sounds. So you must first check that the thing is genuine. And the question there is a fair one. They do what they call tongues. It's in quotes there. Is it really foreign languages unlearned? Are you sure you're really speaking a foreign language, which is an absolute miracle? Those of us who speak certain languages know that it takes a lot of work to learn a language. My goodness, if I could open my mouth now and speak in Dutch or in Scandinavian languages or Chinese, I would know for sure, once I proved this, that this was an absolute miracle. Why don't they so, expect the building to shake? Because yeah, they so, haven't realized exactly. It's, it's not so something should, for today. Should we, yeah. sh should we expect this to happen every Sunday if we profess yeah. to have this gift of tongues? Or are well, we, we might, reading yes, this? We might expect that sort of miracle. And I've been trying to say this morning that apostolic miracles are unique and cannot be repeated. Why? Because you today, whoever you are, cannot be an apostle with a capital A. You cannot. Because the, the condition for being an apostle is you must have seen Jesus alive and you haven't. After his resurrection, you're a witness to the resurrection physically, you saw Jesus alive. And you don't have the accrediting signs of an apostle. That's using Paul's phrase. Apostles, with a capital A, have the accrediting miraculous signs to prove they're apostles. If you can demonstrate that when you walk into a hospital and your shadow passes over somebody in a bed and he finds, suddenly gets well again, go for it. But be honest with yourself and admit that that is not happening. So that was my point there. Um, another comment here. Uh, yeah. So many Protestants call the Holy Bible the Word of God. Yes. Wrong. It's a mistake. So, yes. so my question is, so what does the Bible call the Bible? Ah, Great question. What does the Bible call the Bible? The answer is scripture, holy scripture. And when Jesus gave a Bible lesson in Luke 24, it says that he discussed who he was from the holy scriptures. He meant the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's the whole of the Hebrew Bible, which is not the Old Testament, as though it's somehow passe or finished. It's certainly the Old Covenant, which is old and gone. That's true. But the scriptures is the answer to that question. The Bible calls itself scripture. And Jesus, I want to tell you, was a Bible man. He was a scripture man. If the scripture said it was true for him, so you're in good company if you are referring to the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, as scripture, which is probably two-thirds of your Bible. 
you must realize, as they taught me correctly in, in a Bible college, they said to me, if you misunderstand the Old Testament scriptures, you're bound to misunderstand the New. There's a great deal of truth in that. The one is based on the other. Go to Luke 24 and see that Jesus, as a model Bible teacher, gave a whole account from all of the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the writings, the threefold division of the Hebrew Bible, which is certainly scripture. And okay. just another comment, uh, mm. Ryrie Study Bible. Yes. On verses 24 to 30, a prayer of thanksgiving mm -hmm. for the sovereign power of God, not a prayer for deliverance from further opposition. That's right. The only petition in the prayer is for boldness. Yes, that's a good point from Ryrie there, isn't it? They didn't say, oh God, we want this uh, persecution to stop. They re realized from Acts 14, 22, and I'll be making much in subsequent weeks of the eight kingdom of God texts in Acts, eight of them. You're supposed to know all of them. There they are. Carlos has them ready. We'll, we'll, we'll stress that. In 1422, the fourth one down there, it says this, through much tribulation, not the great tribulation, but through much tribulation, we are destined to enter the kingdom. So if you are suffering tribulation in any way, and I know that many of you, all of us in fact are, then that's to be expected because God is training and preparing the rulers of that future kingdom. And so if you want your Navy SEALs, to use the analogy, to be proven and tested, you're going to have to put them through much tribulation. We must enter, we're destined in God's plan to enter that future kingdom of God through lots of trouble, persecutions in this case. Here it is. Okay, so persecution, hatred from your own family is to be expected. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, Jesus said. When people hate you, say all kinds of evil against you, what did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? I'll quote it to you. He said, be very happy, be very rejoicing, very much rejoicing, because that's the way they persecuted the prophets. So you're in very good company when your family or your friends say, you idiot, you heretic, and so on. That sounds good to me. Rejoice and be very happy about that because that's the way they treated the true prophets. So if you are in the knowledge of truth, expect to be hated and persecuted. That's par for the course. Okay. All right. Let's finish up the chapter. So we're in yeah. Acts 4, verse 32. 32. Thank you. Yeah. And the place shook. I mean, I ask you, when you pray in the morning, does the house shake? Probably not. Does that mean you're failing? Of course not. These are apostolic signs. They were all filled with Holy Spirit. Filled with Holy Spirit. I left out the article there deliberately. Holy Spirit is divine presence and power not impersonal very personal because it's the activity the extension of either god or jesus wouldn't matter who either from god the father very personal but not a third person i hope you'll get that distinction clear very personal because my spirit is coming to you now in terms of the words that i'm speaking very personal but not a different person from me that's the definition of holy spirit with no article in the greek and very clearly in the english with holy spirit and they spoke the gospel word the gospel of the kingdom with all boldness so that spirit of god gives you an extraordinary zeal and excitement over preaching the gospel of the kingdom and now look at 32 it gets better the group of those who believed in the gospel of the kingdom had accepted the gospel word of the kingdom from the apostles were of one mind and heart. Oh, one mind and heart. I remind you that Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I want you brothers and sisters to be of one mind and heart, totally united, that there be no divisions among you. I say with some shame that the church, Unitarian or otherwise, is far from united and we need to work on getting unity. And here's the result then, as Luke says so logically, and his reporting is so precise, it's a marvel to me. Not one of them claimed that any of his belongings was his own. Now, this is not a form of communism, 
that we recommend today. We're not living in these apostolic times, but under these circumstances as a public demonstration of truth to the hostile Jews and others, people were willing to give up their own belongings. Now, people are very generous in the Unitarian community. I know that. People are very generous in their giving and so on in many ways, and that's entirely right. And here they had a super uh, special uh, case of generosity. They shared their property in common. I don't think this means that you should sell your house today and distribute the proceeds to other Christians. I don't think it means that at all, because later you'll find in the New Testament that Paul recognizes that some people have property. That's fine. They're richer than others. It's just that the rich should be generous with what they own and with great power. That word great, you see, is very important in the Bible. Not just power, with great power, the apostles, the apostles who had the accrediting signs and wonders of the apostles. That's what was driving them. They were giving their testimony. This is a legal word. I've mentioned to you many times, the Bible is a legal word. God is the prosecutor. We are being prosecuted and we are actually prosecuting other people when we explain the truth to them and we give our testimony. It's a witness word, a legal term. What were they prophesying here? What were they giving their testimony to? What were they making their legal statement about? It was the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's not a small deal. They're saying, look, we saw Jesus die. We watched him be buried. And guess what? We have seen him alive. There are thousands, millions of atheists and agnostics in the world today who don't believe a word of it. They have not accepted the legal testimony of the apostles to the fact of a human being dying and coming to life again. That's what it means. The resurrection of the Lord, lowercase l I put, says you don't think that this is God being resurrected. One of your great proofs about God and Jesus is that God cannot die. So any statement about Jesus that he died or any statement about Jesus of his blood shed proves to you immediately that he cannot be God because God is immortal. God cannot die. That's what immortal means. This is a very easy point to teach your children. The death of Jesus proves that he couldn't be God. And when they were preaching great, not just average, but great special apostolic grace, that's the almost parallel to spirit. The grace of God is the gift of God through his spirit. The influence of God on these people was huge on them all. No one lacked anything. This was a sort of temporary communist system, if you like, not to be applied literally today, because those who owned property and houses sold them and brought the money from those sales. Interesting business statement there, very clear. And they placed that money at the apostles' feet. The apostles are a huge authority in the Bible. You're supposed to obey an apostle. We don't have apostles with a capital A today. Some might claim that. Some others might claim to be prophets like Agabus and predict the future, but they have inevitably proven to be false because their predictions didn't happen. So they put the money in front of the apostle. Now let's see what happened in this extraordinary story. Imagine reading this or hearing this in the news in the morning. They laid the property at the apostle's feet to be distributed according to what everybody had as a need. That's a very special event not to be copied literally today. Although generosity and kindness to others should be a feature of all Christians at all times. Now, what happened in 36? Joseph, who was known also as Barnabas, which translated because names have special meanings, translated as son of encouragement. Son of means related to having the quality and gift of encouraging others. Son of means related to. So he was the son of encouragement, Barnabas was. He was also a Levite. That's the priestly tribe in the 12 tribes, the Levite especially then 
commission to function in the religious sphere in Israel and also a native of Cyprus where I've certainly been some of you have too little island there in the Mediterranean Cyprus what he did was to sell some land that he owned and he brought the money I notice note now the repetition of the same phrase and laid that money at the apostles feet in complete subjection to the extraordinary apostolic authority of those apostles anybody want to comment so, on that yeah yeah let me mm. uh, comment on yeah please do uh verse 32 mm. so the early church were of one mind and heart now yeah. we call our ministry a restoration fellowship mm. and along with many other ministries who use the word restoration mm -hmm. in their names uh we believe like they do that we're trying to restore yep. uh christianity to yep. to this uh to these teachings we find here so yep. let me focus mm -hmm. on what you said so paul says uh at times the same thing i want you to be of one mind yes. one heart i was looking at philippians 4 yes therefore my beloved brothers and sisters whom i long to see my joy and crown mm. that's nice tender yes stand firm in the lord in this way my beloved okay, what way well he urges a, a couple yes. of believers here to live in harmony in the lord yes indeed true companion I ask you also to help these women, some women there who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. their fellow workers. So yep. uh, Paul is greatly invested in this unity of mind, yes. unity of sound doctrine. Yes. And then I found this uh, statistic, Anthony, there are more than 200 Christian denominations in the U.S. alone yes 45,000 globally wow according to a study yeah so yeah. what type of judgment uh, <laughs> falls now on the so-called Christianity that we are part of in this age well it's not ideal something has gone wrong and uh, the question we're putting to our audience is what went wrong it's not at all difficult to see that from the second century onwards Apostolic Christianity began to fall apart under the influence of Greek philosophy against which Paul warned. The first thing they did was to deface and to deform the creed of Jesus. So you say to your friends, if you want to sound like Jesus, that's great. If you want to be like Jesus, that's great. But then what did Jesus say about God? And there in Mark 12, as we started our, our service today, Jesus was a biblical Unitarian, clearly. He wasn't a Trinitarian, so if you're going to a church where they promote God as Trinitarian, I have to warn you that that doesn't sound like Jesus. So you can ask your pastor to preach on the fact that the teaching of Jesus is all important. Not just, I believe in Jesus, much too vague, open to all sorts of confusion, much less I've accepted him in my heart, which means nothing at all. You are to believe the gospel. The first command of Jesus, the first command, it's a command, no option, is simply believe in the gospel of the kingdom. Mark is very smart. These apostles knew what was coming and they wrote the scriptures with the desire that what they wrote would be proof against confusion. Unfortunately, this hasn't happened. And this is our fault. And so the words of Jesus are most important. You say to your friends, okay, what's the first command of Jesus? There it is, the Shema. You can do it. Are you going to risk being opposed by your own church? You better do it. Otherwise you are very compromised. Secondly, what's the next command? Well, Mark 1 is brilliant. What Mark did there, Mark 1, 14 to 15, there Jesus is reported as giving you a command. This is a command, no option, no compromise. You are to believe in the gospel of the kingdom I gave you Luke 8, 12 today, who shows that's where the devil knows the trouble is. So I'm afraid you're going to have to stand out and be persecuted. They cannot kill you today because of the 
First Amendment. That's great. We're living in very precious times where we're allowed free speech, at least theoretically. But the devil would like to silence you, would like to cancel you, to use the common terminology today. Don't be put off by that. The apostles gave us a good example here. They went on preaching boldly. Yeah, okay. Hope Thank you, good. Anthony. We'll leave it there. Thank you. So we will continue in Acts 5. Just an update about upcoming services next month. I will be away for the next two weeks. So that's two Sundays. Uh, next Sunday, February the 5th. And Sunday, February the 12th. We will have a pre-recorded uh, Sunday service next, again, Sunday, February the 5th. So we will not be live, but there will be a recording if you're in the habit of uh, fellowshipping with us. And then uh, Tracy from uh, KOG Missions will be on with Anthony the following Sunday, February the 12th. So just that update from me. So as some of you know, we suffered another loss in our little home church. So our brother Tom Cox who was a quadriplegic. Um, he fell asleep last week. So prayers for Michelle and her family in this uh, difficult time in their lives. But Tom is resting uh, now in, in the Lord Jesus. And uh, before we leave, uh, Tracy did a nice little tribute for Tom that I'd like to play. Before that, though, I'd like to read a few scriptures. I was reminded of this great prayer from King David in Psalm 89. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your anger continue to burn like fire? Remember how short my life is. Have you created the descendants of Adam for no reason? Can a mortal go on living and never see death? Who can set himself free from the power of the grave? Where is the evidence of your mercy, Lord? You swore an oath to David on the basis of your faithfulness. So this is a very <laughs> depressed David. And uh, it, life is sometimes depressing. Uh, as Anthony said, he quoted there, the uh, we must suffer through many trials and tribulations. We must suffer the death of loved ones and friends and the death of just the innocent in this present evil age. It's a very, very difficult life. Um, and David here asking some very deep, serious questions, almost challenging God which is amazing. But I think we're allowed to sometimes do that and God understands us and he knows our hearts and, you know, uh, we're not perfect and we suffer and uh, we have serious questions. But the Christian goal, and this was David's own goal, was to attain to the resurrection, to attain to that life of the age to come or eternal life as many know it and become like christ himself and i was also reminded this week of first john chapter 3 verse 2 it says we know that when christ comes back when he appears we shall be like christ isn't that amazing we shall be like christ first john 3 2 i'm also reminded of the Resurrection passage, of course, in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul describes what a terrible and painful thing death, death is by calling it the sting of death. But one day, this terrible thing, this terrible sting will be removed. Actually, Paul says, it will be swallowed up in victory. So in the end, we will win. Jesus comforted his apostles, if you remember, saying, I have overcome. I have won. And this is before the cross. But such was the confidence of our Lord Jesus. Such was his uh, steadfast 
flint like stone like uh, goal that it was unmovable and i hope for you this this morning if, if you're going through difficult times if you're going through similar loss if you're going through whatever you're going physical pain whatever remember we have to have that flint like stone like mission of of our messiah because we will fall asleep all of us but we will wake up or better yet he will wake us up remember that great story where it says they will hear the my voice they will hear the hear the voice of the son of god and just uh, before i run this nice tribute from tracy isaiah says a day is coming when the people will sing this song in the land of judah our city is strong god himself defends its walls it is time to awaken and sing for joy you dwellers in the earth or in the dust as the glistening radiant dew refreshes the earth so the lord will awaken those dwelling among the dead i love that so my friends let's let's uh if you have lost it recapture that flint like mindset of our lord reminding ourselves that this great message of the gospel of the resurrection the gospel of the coming kingdom this report this good news is good news no matter what you're going through so break the bonds of fear break those bonds of death this this thing that is typical of our fallen human state human nature don't let it creep up on you make make you feel bad make you feel fearful there's nothing to fear you know to quote a uh, churchill uh, nothing to fear but fear itself and let, let's continue in this great great life of preaching the gospel what an honor see it as an honor whatever you're suffering going through but the honor is that you're preaching this good news isn't that amazing so let's continue to remind ourselves of these words of the great prophets of the son of god himself so we mourn the loss of our brother tom he was a good man he was a faithful man a man who looked towards forward the resurrection a man who one day will have this restored glorious body that was taken away so so tragically in his life at such an, a young age he was made quadriplegic by a car accident and um continue prayers for michelle she she did a great service as 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 his wife she a good wife a good mother uh, she faithfully was there at his side till the end. So I'll play this now and please uh, I'll let the video speak for itself as we pray and we thank you. We thank you, Anthony, for your great service all these decades. We thank Barbara for being there at your right hand. And we thank you, our viewers. And please keep uh, the Cox family in your thoughts and minds and thank you tracy for this great tribute god bless everyone <laughs> 